as well. So, okay, well, thank you for joining the presentation today. Like I said, this is the upsides to downsizing housing options for easy living. This is part of my monthly webinar series. So thank you all for joining. Um, and just for a couple housekeeping uh, items, if you don't mind, just make sure that you are on mute. And then if you've got a question or anything, go ahead and throw it in the chat box. I'm happy to answer questions as we go. I'm gonna keep this under an hour and leave some time at the end for questions and answers. So let's go. And for some reason, here we go. All right, so we're gonna cover a few things today. Um, so first of all, we're gonna talk a little bit about the state of the real estate market, just to kind of bring you up to speed because you've probably seen stuff in the media and some of it's true and some of it's not. So I'm just gonna give you some honest data as far as where we are. We're gonna talk a little bit about types of housing to consider as you think about downsizing. Also, just the benefits. You know, What are the things that you could really enjoy in this new stage of life in downsizing your home? Um, popular locations around the U.S. and abroad and just places that I'm seeing a lot of folks moving that are beneficial in retirement. And then the last thing we're going to cover today is how to get your home ready to sell. So as you're looking at downsizing and moving out of a house you might have lived in for many years and raised a family, it can feel kind of daunting. So we're going to just talk about how to take that elephant one bite at a time and make it a little bit easier for you. So, okay. So. Um, who am I? I'm Jackie White. Some of you guys know me, some may not. Uh, I'm a realtor with York Castle Real Estate. And a little bit about me, I've been in the business for, oh gosh, close to, um, let's see, 14 years now. And um, I have two kids. I live in the foothills. I've got a family that's pretty active with sports. I'm always at their, their events, whether it's skiing or basketball or baseball. Um, love to ski, although I'm even better opera skier. I'll tell you, I'm an expert at that. Um, I used to be in marketing. So before I got into real estate, I worked for a number of Fortune 500 companies, including Samsung and DirecTV and Royal McDonald House uh, Charities. So those were really great clients I got to work with. And then I shifted into real estate once I started um, investing in 2012, got licensed. And at the time, uh, you know, I talked to my husband. I said, I think I'm going to do a couple transactions a, a year. And he said, no, I think you're going to do a heck of a lot more. So I've been pretty busy um, since then. Uh, and I've got a few certifications under my belt, um, including a certified mountain area specialist, certified negotiation expert, and then also a seniors real estate specialist, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, in addition to that, I'm really involved in the wildfire and wild land community here within the foothills. So I serve on the board of directors for our local fire department, which is Inner Canyon Fire Protection District. And um, I've also started a nonprofit that focuses on educating uh, neighbors about wildfire awareness and how to best uh, harden their homes. So that's something I like to uh, spend a lot of my time on. And in addition to that, I've been busy selling houses. So as of this August, I have closed um, 250 homes that I've helped for a variety of clients, whether they're buying, they're selling, they're moving out of state, they're downsizing. Uh, and actually many of them are seniors who are going through uh, this big change in their life. So I've been very fortunate to be able to work with all of them and get some recognition along the way, which is great. So, and this is my husband here. So, all right, well, let's dig into what you're here for, which is what's happening in the real estate market and how's that going to impact you if you're thinking about downsizing into a new home. So I'm sure you've read some stuff in the media about the real estate market and keep in mind that a lot of times as with anything, anything that's sensationalized is what's going to get attention. As we, we say, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So of course, there's always some sort of negative spin when you look at what's um, in the media. So what you ought to consider really is what the facts are. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So the last two years, the real estate market has been a huge frenzy. So since the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020, homes were selling very, very quickly. A lot of it was driven by very low interest rates, people being cooped up in their houses and looking for a new environment and having the opportunity to move because they could work from home. And uh, we now are starting to pull back from that environment. And some of that is um, being driven again by interest rates that have climbed up from the sub three interest rates that we were seeing. And um, also, you know, we're just kind of leveling back out to more normal conditions. So anytime there's a change in the real estate market, it pre presents some sort of opportunity for someone. It's just a matter of for whom. And so it's never anything to be scared about. It's just a matter of who's the opportunities um, that they can take advantage of at the time. 
So I want to share a little bit of data. I hope you guys are okay with me being kind of a data nerd. Um, but our brokerage here at Your Castle Real Estate puts together some of these charts. Um, we go through them every quarter and I watch them like a hawk because I think it really provides some good insight to buyers and sellers and investors as they're considering what their next real estate move is. So we've got a ton of data. I could go on for hours about this, but I pulled out a few charts that really um, have the most impact as far as what we're experiencing today. So um, if you look at this chart here, this demonstrates the average appreciation that we've seen over the last 45 years. So on average, it's about 6% annually. So the solid line here represents the average home price and this dotted line are condos and townhomes. So the y-axis here shows the average price. And we've got time starting in the early 70s through today. And, you know, looking back here, you could see that you could buy a house for less than the price of a car today. And we are at a point where we are seeing average home prices kissing 800000 So there is a little bit of some prediction as to what we might expect over the last couple of years. And while this number is dipping, I want to also caution to not be frightened by that. What we're seeing, honestly, I think, is a, a change in the product of homes that we're selling. So we had a lot of luxury home selling uh, because people had the, the means and they could get really low interest rates. And as that uh, shift of inventory goes more towards first-time homeowner owners or maybe trade-up buyers, um, the product mix changes. So it's not that we're selling any less homes or that um, the price point is decreasing. It's just the product mix. So imagine you own a car dealership and you sell a lot of Porsches one year. Well, boy, your book of business is going to look really great. But then maybe the next year you sell a lot of Toyota Corollas, right? And um, those are certainly much cheaper. You might sell just as many cars, but the average price is going to look lower because you're selling more of those entry-level vehicles. So keep that in mind when you talk about home prices. But the news is, you know, this was the time period where we had the recession. So we did have home prices dip a little bit, and then they have come up and really run up in the last two years because of the growth in the Denver metro area. And keep in mind, all this data is going to be focused on the Denver metro area. You know, we talk a lot about right now being in a recession and, you know, what we are seeing is that just because we're in a recession doesn't mean that home prices are going to fall or that we're having a housing crisis. This actually shows the last six recessions starting in the 80s. And we actually had home prices go up during that time. Now, everybody remembers what happened in 2008, but that was a completely different environment because we had a lot of uh, mortgages that were just giving out to anybody that could fog a mirror, right? And so now we have um, a very small inventory of homes for sale. And so we're not in the same environment that we were in 2008. So as far as entering a recession, that doesn't really scare me. There's usually some sort of correction that needs to happen, but we don't have a lot of houses for all the demand and the banks are under all sorts of federal re regulations. So the environment that existed in 2008 that allowed things to get out of control does not exist today. The other thing I wanted to uh, talk about is just like looking at the historical uh, context and you know a few things that are really important to remember is that home prices have gone up on average 6% a year. Um, and in the last 44 years, we only had four years where home prices went down. So that really isn't a lot. And most of that was in um, 2008. So just because we have an average um, home price that's a record, doesn't mean the next year it has to go down. It, it, it's continuing to go up here in the Denver metro area. So here's another chart that shows a little bit about what's happening here in the Denver area. And we look at the active homes that were on the market going back to 2007, the solid line, and the dotted line are those that actually sold. So the space between these two is your inventory. So those are the homes that are available to buy. And you can see that over time, these two lines have started to converge. So all of the inventory that existed during the housing crisis of 2008 and 2009, so foreclosures and bank owned properties or sellers that simply couldn't sell their house because there wasn't enough buyers out there to, um, to have interest, their um, homes sat and did not sell as quickly. As time has gone on and the economy has improved, looking at 2014, we really started to see an improvement. Uh, in terms of basically every home coming on the market is being sold quickly. Now, I see that these two lines are starting to separate a little bit. And again, some of that is being driven by uh, the interest rates. So they were two and a half, three 
from the early pandemic days through the end of 2021. And then beginning of 22, uh, the interest rates started to go up. And now we're about six, six and a half, seven, depending on your um, your financial situation and your credit score and your debt to income ratio. So as interest rates go up, it becomes less affordable for some buyers. So either the uh, purchase price that they were interested in has now decreased or their monthly payment is putting a squeeze on their budget. And so they're pulling back on what they're interested in looking at in terms of buying. Now, there certainly are still buyers out there. People have to buy a house every day. There's people that go through a divorce or they have a death or they have a birth and they have a marriage and they have happy things going on in their lives or maybe a job change. So there's always people that are out there buying. Um, it's just not quite as extreme as we saw in the last two years. And another thing I wanted to point out is you've got probably for some of these terms, buyer's market and seller's market, right? And how do we define those? Well, we're looking at who kind of has the upper hand in the environment that exists. So if you think about the early 80s when interest rates were very high, there were a lot of homes on the market and a lot of buyers. And so we call that a buyer's market because they could really push the envelope on the offers that they made on houses and have a little bit more of the upper hand in negotiations. And then the seller's market is where there are a ton of buyers interested in homes and not a lot of them available. So we look at if we had the same number of buyers and same number of sellers, how long would it take to deplete the inventory? So anything over six months is considered a buyer's market. Less than four months is a seller's market. And then we kind of have this middle zone where it's a balanced area. So you can see we're certainly in a seller's market. It certainly is decreasing in terms of the, or I'm sorry, increasing in terms of the months of inventory, but we are still solidly in a seller's market. So why downsize? Now that you have a little bit of information about what's happening in the real estate market, you might be just thinking about where you are in your stage of life and where you are in terms of your housing needs. And I talk to a lot of seniors and empty nesters about what their next move is. And it's just something they're pondering. And sometimes it takes a long time to get to the decision because they've been in their home for many years. Maybe they raised a family and they've had a lot of memories and emotions wrapped up in that home. And so it takes some time to go through the process of deciding that it's time. And, you know, my goal is always to just provide information so that when the time is right, you can make a solid decision. So we're going to talk a little bit about why downsizing might be a good idea for you. So first item I always hear about is, well, it's a lot less maintenance, right? You don't need this big house, all these extra bedrooms, you know, you got to heat it, you got to maintain it. It's just less that you have to deal with. If you maybe have kids that have grown out of a home and you're just down to one or two people in the household, you know, a smaller yard, you may not have to go out and mow the lawn or, you know, maintain things or plow the driveway. Of course, you know, we talked about lower utility bills, um, you know, for a lot of folks in Colorado too, especially those that are in the foothills, um, I find that there's a lot of health benefits for those that do move to a lower elevation or out of state. Um, and so there certainly could be a benefit with that. They might have COPD, um, sleep apnea, migraines, and I've heard of several clients that have moved to lower elevations and I've checked in with them once they've moved out of state and boy, they feel a lot better. So I'm not a doctor, but I have found that to be um, something that's beneficial. You know, another thing I hear a lot of people talking about is moving out of a two-story house into a ranch, having less uh, stairs and something that's more main floor living. Um, and that can simply mean that maybe you turned your knee when you were skiing and it just is uncomfortable using the stairs. So it's a little bit easier living for you. And of course, you know, being closer to medical facilities, if you've got, you know, doctor appointments that happen more frequently, or even close to family and friends and grandkids, that can be a big benefit too. And sometimes that involves multi-generational living, which we'll get into here in a moment. So we talked a little bit about the real estate market. Let's talk about why it might be a great time to sell now. So the Colorado market is still very strong compared to the rest of the nation. So we've got a lot of folks that are looking to live here for all the reasons we love it too, right? 300 days of sun a year, access to all sorts of outdoor activities, um, a strong job market, and it's just a great place to live. And so there are still people that are interested in moving to Colorado um, and a lot of millennials that are interested in buying their first or maybe second home. So looking at the demographics of the Denver metro area, millennials make up the largest segment of our population and they've all hit a median age of 30. And with that milestone birthday tends to drive um, some big life changes, whether that's thinking about getting married, starting a family, 
or just simply not renting anymore. And those are driving housing purchases. So we still have a lot of demand with all these millennials who are now looking at buying homes. Now the market is becoming a little bit more balanced. So I've had a lot of uh, empty nesters and retirees in the last couple of years say, gosh, I can't handle the stress of, you know, making an offer in this environment where there's people competing for a house and I'm going to have to offer a heck of a lot more than what the buyer or seller is asking for. And so they are looking to just sit in the sidelines, right? Because they don't want to get caught up in that frenzy. Well, it's not quite as crazy now. Okay. So as far as having multiple offers on houses or skipping the inspections and giving up all of your rights as a buyer, that is happening less and less right now. So you're in a little bit more of a balanced market in that the buyers can still have a conversation and negotiate with the seller. And so that could uh, be to your benefit. The thing that's really key though, and I know I've got some folks on here that live in the foothills, is we're kind of in a unique environment right now. So for folks that own homes in the Conifer, Evergreen, Morrison, Pine, you know, Indian Hills area, this is a really desirable place. So for people that are moving to Colorado, they envision living in the mountains and having the views and trees and a little bit more elbow room. And so we've got a great product here in the foothills. So we are in this little area that still has a lot of demand. But if you're thinking about moving into downsizing and maybe moving down the hill into town or out of state, um, when you go purchase, it may not be quite so uh, dramatic in terms of the seller's market down there. So you have a little bit more time. You have some options to look at houses. You can have conversations when you're doing, you're negotiating, um, but you have a little bit more of an upper hand on the sale of your house. So I really feel like the um, empty nesters that live in the foothills right now have a really unique situation that they could take advantage of um, if it's time to downsize. And quite honestly, as far as, you know, townhomes and condos and smaller homes with less maintenance, most of those do exist down the hill as opposed to in the foothills. So that's where you've got a little bit of an upper hand if you choose to make that move. So um, what type of homes are available out there if you're thinking about downsizing? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, there's all sorts of things to consider as far as what you might be looking for in your new home. And maybe if you're entering retirement, or you're already there, there's just different lifestyle things that might be um, of greater need for you today. So, you know, if you are entering retirement, maybe just, you know, taking it easy and being able to travel is something that's important to you. So, you know, are you thinking about splitting time between cities? You know, I've got clients that have a, a condo here in Denver, and then they've got one in Minneapolis. So they can go back and forth and visit their grandkids and then still be able to be here near here and you're some other uh, family and friends. Um, maybe you want to snowboard, maybe you stay up here for the summer, go somewhere warmer in the winter, go down to Arizona. That certainly drives a lot of folks. And I hear a lot of the lock and leave um, situation that uh, folks are looking for, which means you've got a place that you can live in. And then when you want to travel, just lock the door and take off. And maybe there's a homeowners association. I know those get a bad rap, but they can be great as far as taking care of the maintenance outside, the uh, uh, lawn, taking care of and snow removal. And you don't have to think about a thing. Just lock the door, go travel, go visit the grandkids, and not have to worry about that. So that can be a big benefit as well. You know, some of my clients that I work with um, love to eat and entertain and that they've got a little bit more time on their hands and they can really explore their culinary skills. And so maybe you need a house that has um, a great kitchen and, um, you know, a place where you can entertain and have guests over to enjoy your um, your cooking. So think about that. If you like to entertain, maybe that's indoors or outside. We've got great weather here in Colorado. So having an outdoor space like a deck or patio might be something that's important to you. So think about those things as you're considering what your next house might look like. And of course, if you're in retirement, it's great to be able to have time for, you know, some of those hobbies that you may not have been able to enjoy before. So, you know, sometimes that drives the type of space that somebody needs in terms of their new home. So whether you're into woodworking or painting or yoga, maybe you need a space that you can kind of dedicate to that hobby. Um, and then I've got a lot of folks who have a lot of outdoor toys. So they might have a camper or an RV that they're taking across the country uh, in the summers and they need a dedicated place to park that. Maybe it needs to be covered or winterized or um, just a, a level place to park it or near some sort of storage facility where they can go and access it and, and uh, load it up before a trip. So think about those things if you're into boating or camping or having some um, extra toys, or maybe it's car collection, then you're, you're tinkering with that as part of your retirement. Now, when we talk about retirement, 
there's not, um, there are some folks that do kind of uh, have what we call an encore career. I don't know if you've heard of that term before, but there are a lot of professionals out there that have had a, a great career and maybe they're thinking about doing something a little bit different and maybe it's part-time or something they've always had an interest in um, because they like to work and they like to stay engaged. And so that might be something that's best for you. And so thinking about being in a city where it's easy to access that job or having a space at home where you can work remotely, maybe it's part-time or even if it's full-time, just having a place that's um, convenient for you. So think about that that's important as well. Now, uh, a lot of decisions that drive real estate purchases and sales really have to do with your family. And sometimes I work with folks that are grandparents and they're really excited about being in this new role in their life. And so part of that might come with offering to babysit and being a childcare option for the grandkids. And so think about if you need space in the home for maybe sleepovers or a playroom or an outside yard where the kids can hang out and, and play while you're being that childcare resource, or even if they're just there to visit for the weekend. Um, because if you've got a big family and it's growing, that might be um, important to you. And then keep in mind that multi-generational living is something that is becoming more popular as well. And so that might be something where you've got multiple generations under one roof. You might be there with your kids and maybe grandkids as well. Part of multi-generational living is really having a space for everybody either under one roof or all on the same property. So it could be a duplex, which is two homes next to each other. You might share a wall, you might have one family next to you, and then you're living right here and you can be near each other, but you have a little bit of space and that can be convenient. Um, many people have heard about mother-in-law suites. So this could be a little area that's in the lower level or upstairs or somewhere that's like an apartment within the house. Um, so I've had folks that need that for 100% of the time for mom and dad to live with them, or they anticipate that they might need that for their um, aging parents as well. And so they know that they've got this a large unfinished basement or area that they can convert if they feel like their parents might need to move in as well. Or maybe they are having mom and dad come and visit for a few months out of the year. So it's good to have that space available. Um, and then also we have what's called accessory dwelling units that are kind of popular in Denver. And that might be like a little guest house or a carriage house in the backyard. And so mom and dad have a little space or maybe you live there and your kids are in the main home. It really kind of depends on what the situation is. But, you know, part of this really is going to be what's your relationship like with your family and having some real frank conversations before going into this, because it's a pretty big commitment. So you got to think about privacy and chores and, you know, how is everybody going to live under one roof again? Um, so thinking about, you know, who's going to pay for food and utilities and, you know, how is everybody going to live under the same roof? Um, you know, might have been apart for a while and now you're coming back together. So think through those things. Um, and create some ground rules before you really move forward with this because it can be a big commitment. And then being able to have an open line of communication is important too. So if it feels like things are kind of off track, it's not quite what you were expecting, being able to have that live dialogue with the family members and say, okay, we had expected this, it might be going a different direction, how do we get back into the middle? And finally, come up with an, an, an end game plan. So you know what, maybe everybody goes in with the best intentions and something changes. It doesn't work out living under one roof, or maybe somebody's got to move for a job change, or there's some sort of dynamic that might have everybody separate again. So coming up with that game plan ahead of time can relieve a lot of stress um, and figuring out how to also exit financially as well. So, you know, as you're looking at what your next house might be, you might also think about what do you like to do? Do you like to really be active? Um, there's a lot of active adult communities here in uh, the Front Range. We call those 55 plus or age restricted communities. And it's a great way to be among your peers. And if you're really social and you want to be around um, some folks your age or be able to uh, meet new friends in a new environment, 
easily, these 55 plus communities can be a great option for you. And typically they're what we call deed restricted, which means that only folks that are 55 and older can live in that area. So you're pretty much assured that you're gonna have um, folks that are your peers living in there. And they typically come with a lot of activities and events. So keeping everybody really engaged so you can meet each other um, because you might've lived in another neighborhood that was very family oriented and now you're in this new stage of life. And so everybody is looking to um, meet each other and engage. So there's quite a few 55 plus communities in Denver. I'm gonna share a couple of them you, uh, with you here, but there are plenty of them out there, but I pulled just a few that are um, you know, quite popular. So the first one is Anthem Ranch. It's in Broomfield, Colorado. So just kind of Northwest of Denver. Um, the price point there of homes is about 600,000 to about 1.4 million. So it's really gonna dep depend on if you're in a duplex or paired home or in a single family home. Uh, and then they also have a variety of sizes. So, you know, we can see here, there's a little bit more of a smaller downsized home. This might be more of a ranch, um, but still is smaller yard, less to maintain. Uh, a lot of those homes were built between 2005 and 2011. And they do have this beautiful rec center um, where they've got all sorts of activities going on. It's called the Aspen Center. And there's pickleball, bourbon tasting. That looked great to me. Um, summer concerts. So there's all sorts of um, activities to engage with your neighbors and the community. Another place that you might have heard of here in Denver is called um, Green Gables Reserve. So this is just off of Wadsworth in the Lakewood area. I've helped some clients purchase in this community. And they have um, a 55 plus section of a broader community. So they have duplexes, so you have half of the house, but the way they're oriented, they really kind of live like a single family home. You don't really know that you're attached. Um, so those folks are kind of in one little gated area and then you've got some townhomes, you've got single family homes, you've got a variety of um, backgrounds uh, and age groups but there is that specific 55 plus area. Um, and so Green Gables Reserve used to be a beautiful um, golf course and then they built this community on top of this. The price point for the duplexes or half, you know, the, half of the duplex um, for these 55 plus area is about uh, the mid 800s. And those homes were built about five, six years ago in 2017. Um, they've got a really beautiful clubhouse with a pool and all sorts of activities. And then they have this um, fishing pond and you'd be shocked, it's right in the middle of Lakewood. Um, so this is beautiful that just provides some uh, access to nature right there in the neighborhood. Uh, and it's adjacent to their um, pool and rec center. And it's super easy to get up Wadsworth. Gosh, it's probably a mile up to Belmar, shopping, dining, all sorts of stuff to do over there too. So it's a good location. And then the last place I wanted to share with you as far as um, 55 plus, again, there's many of these communities here, but just giving you kind of a sampling is Heritage Eagle Bend, which is in Aurora. And this is a huge community um, that has a large 55 plus uh, contingency. And it is also on a golf course. So the houses really can range from the low, I'm um, sorry, the upper 500s to the low 900s. And they were all built in the early 2000s. Um, but they have a beautiful clubhouse. You can see here, they've got pickleball, they've got the pool, they've got all sorts of activities, um, dining, uh, meeting space, they've got bocce ball, pickleball, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and while it is a golf course community, one of the things I find that some folks are looking for is they don't even play golf. But it's nice to have a little bit of buffer uh, between the neighbors. So they've got this green space. So that's really just considered more of a green space for them, not necessarily something they're going to use. But it's, it's nice to know the golf is there. If they choose to go down that route in retirement, um, even if they're not a, a golf enthusiast at the moment. So again, this is Heritage Eagle Bend out in Aurora. So sometimes um, for folks that are looking to downsize, that might be moving out of state. And with the uh, real estate market here in Denver that has appreciated so much, and if you've been in your house for more than five or 10 years, you've seen a lot of appreciation. Um, I find that a lot of the empty nesters and retirees that I work with have a ton of equity. And so by selling their home, they're able to capture that and then go buy a new home, um, essentially for cash out of state in a variety of different markets. And that's a big benefit to them because they don't have to think about having a mortgage. Um, sometimes they end up with a little bit of extra money to spend on hobbies or traveling or, or even just decorating the house. So they can find that to be a big benefit. But when you're moving out of state, you know, there's some logistics involved in that. And I found that some folks really benefit from moving to the new place um, and then renting an Airbnb for a while. Get a furnished uh, apartment 
and take a couple months, explore the area, learn what the new communities are, where you like to be, where are the stores and the dining that you want to have access to um, before you commit to a new house as you explore this new community. Um, and get a referral to a, a great realtor that lives in that area that really knows the different communities and can kind of point you in the right direction based on your interests. Uh, as we discussed earlier, lower elevation can be easier on some people's health, so moving out of state does have that benefit for some. Now, you'll want to do some research because there's some tax benefits of moving to certain states. Um, Delaware, um, I have found in a Kiplinger study, is number one. Uh, apparently, there's you know no sales tax, low property taxes, and no death taxes. So if you're thinking about estate planning, that can be a big benefit. And actually, Colorado, I looked up, was number seven. So we've got property taxes that are the third lowest in the U.S., um, and no state, estate, or inheritance taxes. So we do have some higher than average um, local sales taxes, but there's some trade-offs there. So what are some other great locations in the US and Canada? So Tennessee is really growing. I've, any of you have been to Nashville, it's a great place, especially if you love live music, but it does offer some beautiful rolling hills and a rural landscape um, that is similar to parts of Colorado without the dramatic Rockies, but I'm um, giving you a little bit of buffer and a little bit of country feel to it. So um, with a low tax burden as well, that can be a big uh, benefit. Another place, it seems like it's kind of a no brainer is Florida, right? There's plenty of 55 plus communities down there. If you've ever looked into this, there's a huge place called the Villages. Um, I haven't been there myself, but my parents have checked that out and um, they have activities galore and all sorts of, I mean, it's just made to be very, very social. Um, so that's a great place to consider. But there's all sorts of beautiful beaches in Florida. I have a lot of experience in visiting family in Tampa and Orlando, and there's just a lot of stuff going on. So of course the weather is um, forgiving in the winter as well. Uh, Pennsylvania actually, and Pittsburgh specifically is um, getting some attention. I actually lived in Pittsburgh uh, for two years before I moved out to Colorado. Um, I've actually been on this. This is called the Incline, this little cog railway thing. Um, and this is where the three rivers come together here in downtown Pittsburgh. They've got a beautiful downtown, lots of activities, huge if you're a sports fan. They've got tons of, um, you know, between the Steelers and, you know, all the other sports that are there. It's a great place. Um, higher education is really valued and they've got really affordable housing and healthcare. Uh, Virginia is another place um, that people are interested in, and especially since the beginning of the pandemic, um, Charlottesville, Roanoke, and Virginia Beach has seen a lot of growth as well. So those are just some other great places to check out. And British Columbia is a great place for active people looking for adventure and being outdoors. So looking at the Pacific Northwest might be another option for you. And then I've actually had some friends that have looked abroad. Um, I've got one friend in particular that is uh, planning what her retirement is going to look like. And one of the places she checked out was Panama. And so it's got a mild climate, uh, their infrastructure has been updated and there's just a lot of access to beaches. So that's a really great place. And I know she felt pretty safe when she was down there. So that might be a cool place to check out. Being close to Mexico, many of you may have taken a vacation there once or twice and not even thought about living there permanently, but it actually has a pretty um, thriving expat community where there's a lot of Americans that are moving down there. So um, outside of Cancun, there's lots of little towns and villages and some places to check out. Um, I actually had the opportunity to go to Cabo in October, and that was a really beautiful place. And there's a ton of growth there, too. It almost felt like an Americanized um Mexico. So it was a great place. It was almost like Mexico and Arizona had a baby, quite honestly, but the beaches were beautiful, a great place to check out. And Costa Rica, uh, if any of you have been there, another great option. I've had the opportunity to travel there as well. Beautiful country. Um, I'm anxious to get back and there's a huge expat community as well. Um, you know, close to a million folks that are living there that are from the U.S. So, um, and the culture is super friendly. Um, if you've read the book about the blue zones, which is where you have the highest concentration of octogenarians, um, Costa Rica is on that list and uh, they call it the happiest place on earth. So I'm sure that has something to do with this. So if you want to live to hundred, Costa Rica might be your option. And then Portugal uh, is another one. Uh, that has gotten a lot of attention. And, and the friend I was speaking about earlier, she's actually purchased a place in Portugal. So um, great access to healthcare, um, affordable uh, cost of living, and really easy access to Europe. So as you're traveling, if you want to get out and that's part of your plans for retirement, that's another option too. 
And then finally, Greece um, has easy visa processes and some pretty low taxes too. And quite honestly, this looks pretty to me. I would go sit here and have a glass of wine any day of the week. So Greece looks like a cool place to check out. So as you're thinking about this, and I appreciate you jumping on, it must be something that's in the back of your mind. Really, um, you got to think about what your plan is, right? And that can make the process a whole lot easier if you kind of know what the next steps are as you're thinking about moving and downsizing. So first step really is to get some help from a realtor, have that person come over to your home and talk about what your goals are and what the market conditions are doing and get it what we call a comparative market analysis of your home's value. So that's where a realtor will look at recent sales in your neighborhood and in the area and kind of give you a heads up on what your home could be worth if it was on the market. And that will help you back into what your net proceeds or what your amount of money is that you're going to walk away from the sale of your house. And that will help dictate where you want to move, whether that's staying in Colorado or going elsewhere, um, when you know what your budget is for your new home. And, you know, really, it's important to be uh, updated as far as where the market is going and having that information about your home's value. Otherwise, it's just kind of operating in a vacuum. So I always find it valuable to get the details when I'm trying to make a big decision. And so I think that's the same thing as far as this process, just really understanding, you know, what's your house worth and then what are you going to make off of it and what you can use for the next purchase. So much of this really is driven by timing too. So understanding, you know, what you need to do to get the house ready. Uh, if you've lived in the home for a while, um, there might just be a little bit of cleaning up and decluttering that has to happen, right? You know, I've been in my home for five years and I was shocked recently of how much has accumulated just in that short time. So, you know, coming up with a game plan of how to get the house ready. Um, also, what time of year are you going to sell it? There are some strategies around time of year and what's going to get you the most uh, amount of activity on the sale of your house. Um, and then sometimes there's just family considerations. Maybe you've got a, a grown child that's going to get married or have a baby or there's some other uh, family reunions. Just think through that. Um, but there is some strategy around timing as far as being able to sell your house for the most amount of money um, due to historical trends as far as when um, buyers are most looking for homes. So one of the questions I get really often is, what if my house sells quickly? I don't want to be homeless, right? Um, well, there's some ways that you can work around this. And I can tell you of those 250 houses that I've sold, never had a client be homeless, knock on wood. So um, one of the things you can do is once you're under contract, meaning that uh, the buyer has made an offer and you've taken it, call that the contract period. Um, when you're doing those negotiations, you can ask for what's called a post-closing occupancy agreement uh, or time frame where you rent back your own house. So this allows you to have a little bit longer time frame where you can go and secure that new home, or even if it's just to help with moving logistics. So typically between when your offer is accepted and then the sale is complete, that usually takes about 30 days. And then the rent back period can be up to 60 days if the buyer has a mortgage on the home that they're purchasing. So really, you could get yourself a 90-day window where you can be looking for new houses, um, getting prepared to move. Um, to your new place. Um, and I always encourage my clients to have that rent back period because even if you only need a couple days, ask for two weeks, right? Um, maybe we get snow and the moving truck has challenges getting to your house or you just need a little bit extra time to pack up. So much easier doing that. So I always try to negotiate that for my clients and um, quite often they don't have to pay for it. So it's just a nice benefit. I think, like I said, it kind of stretches out that timeline uh, as far as when you have to move to your new home and when you identify that replacement home. So when you're getting the house ready, you know, there's some stuff that um, is really kind of a no brainer when it comes to getting it ready, but also it's great to have a professional come in and give you some advice on what was going to give you your biggest bang for your buck. You know, sometimes I have folks say, geez, I think we need to renovate the kitchen before we put the house on the market. And that can take a lot of time, a lot of expense, and maybe it's just not even your taste is what a buyer might want anyways. Um, and with all the, you know, logistics and um, issues with getting all sorts of building materials or even getting somebody to your house, that could really put you in a different time of year or a different market environment. So sometimes it's better off just to price the home based on its current condition, but then do a few things that really have a big impact, like carpet and paint and decluttering, you know, catching up on some maintenance, you know, look at that honeydew list, start chipping away at it and take care of some of those things. And then there's just basic stuff like sweeping the chimney, um, if you live in the foothills, there's septic permits that you've got to get. And we can always talk about that. You can ask, give me a ring if that applies to you. But um, 
ultimately decluttering is free. It doesn't cost a dime and that can really have a big impact as well. And when you're looking at decluttering, um, you know, I find that it's best to just focus on one room at a time. So rather than looking at your whole house, start in the guest room, go to the office, go to the family room and just go one closet at a time. There's probably a lot of stuff you've been meaning to get rid of anyways, um, tossing things, donating it, um, paring down the furniture to make the home feel bigger and really neutralizing the decor is going to attract the most number of buyers to your house. And, you know, all those closets, I know it's hard for me to fold up my fitted bed sheets, but you know, you, when all that stuff is crammed in there and a buyer opens up a closet, it's going to feel like there's not a lot of storage, right? So you don't want all this stuff falling on a buyer when they're looking around your house. So just getting really organized is key. And there's a lot of resources out there to help you along with this too. So there's companies out there called junk haulers. And if you've got stuff, I mean, you've probably seen the commercials, they'll come to your house, you just point at it and it's out of here. Um, you can pile up a bunch of stuff in the garage, they'll come take it and you just pay them a fee and you're not going back and forth to the dump or putting it out the curb for the garbage man to pick it up for weeks on end, it's just out of there, right? Um, the AmFets is a great uh, organization that will come and take, you know, gently use pieces of furniture or larger items so you don't have to worry about um, getting rid of them. And pickupplease.org is their website. You can um, schedule time, they'll come pick that up. And um, there's some great services out there like professional organizers. I've worked with a few of them. And, you know, if it's something where it feels overwhelming to you, they can really help you with that process. Like they literally will put you at a card table or the dining table and they'll bring one item um, by you at a time, kind of like a conveyor belt. And, and all you have to decide is, do I keep it this? Do I donate it? Am I going to sell it? Or is it out of here? Is it going to the dump, right? And then they go to the next item. Okay, keep, donate, sell, or toss. And that's all you got to do. And because I know for me, when I've gone through my stuff, when I've moved, um, you get kind of caught up like, oh gosh, look at these photo albums, or I forgot about this thing. Where'd that come from? And you just, it slows down the process. But when you've got someone that's helping you and they can move things out, um, keep you on track, it can be really helpful. And the last thing I put in here is don't become a storage unit for the family, right? So if you've got those grown kids, they have their yearbooks from high school, or they've got some of their stuffed animals and the stuff you don't even know if they want it, have them make a decision and they either take it or it's gone, right? Because I know there's a lot of folks out there who are saving all of their kids things that they needed a place to store it and it might be time for that to move on. So ultimately, the thing that I think is going to lead to the best success is, but as far as what I've seen for my clients is really make decisions while you're in control. So that's my best advice to any of my clients that are thinking about downsizing, because I've seen this with family members and clients, and it can be hard to think about moving. You've lived in your house for a long time. You've got memories. Um, you're in this community, but maybe this is the stage in your life where it's time. Um, and it can take a little bit of time to come to that decision, but it's your decision. The last thing you want to do is get in a place where financially or physically with health, you can't make that decision and it's forced upon you or family members are making it for you. And that's not a great place to be in. So when you think that it's time and you're thinking about downsizing, again, the, the most important advice I can give is make that decision while you're in control and it's your decision and no one's making it for you. So um, with that, um, that is the end of our presentation here. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to throw them in the chat. We've got a little bit of time. So feel free to type something in. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll hang out here for a few moments. Other than that, I appreciate you reaching out. And if you have any questions um, or you're looking at maybe moving yourself with like a market analysis on your home's value, happy to do that for you. It's complimentary, no charge. Just want to offer some information to help you make decisions. And um, when you have time, feel free to follow me on Facebook or LinkedIn. And I've got a website with a lot of videos um, that will give you some tips on what it's like to move and sell your house and buy a new one. So um, great resource there. Other than that, I'm happy to hang on. If anybody has any questions, feel free to go to the chat and type away, and um, I will be happy to answer those for you. So I've got a question here. How big was your sample size in the chart that showed prices coming down? So um, I imagine you were talking about one of the charts here. Let me go back to the beginning. I think this question is from Mike. Uh, is this the chart that you were asking about? And feel free to unmute yourself if you like. Um, yeah, that's it, Jackie. And um, sorry, I just want to just make sure I clarify because I don't know if I was yeah. very clear. Um, 
So what Charles and I were talking about is that you talked a little bit about how this chart shows prices coming down, but that that can be deceiving because it could be mixed. It could be that a lot of houses, a lot of properties that are lower priced are selling than they were before. It doesn't necessarily mean that prices are coming down. So the reason why I asked about sample size is because I was saying to him that at a certain point, you might have such a big sample size that it may not be much of a factor, the, the mix. So I was just curious, you know, in this chart, if you have so many houses that may not be an issue, or do you think it, it really is a factor? Yeah, so we sell about 100,000 homes in the Denver metro area a year. So that's kind of the, the sample size. So these, this data covers the Denver metro area on the front range, not all of Colorado or nationally. So um, I think that's a great point. As far as the percentage, I don't have that number off the top of my head as far as how many fall in that luxury category versus more entry-level homes. Um, but we have seen some uh, change in terms of, we did have a lot of luxury homes that were selling. Um, but again, if that product mix changes, which we anticipate could be the case with, you know, higher interest rates, it's going to um, depress people's budgets. And so they're going to look at lower priced homes. Um, that could, again, be the product mix that's going to impact what the average price is if we get more entry level homes or maybe that that first trade up as opposed to like that third or fourth home someone might move into. So I don't have the actual number, but um, as far as the sample size, we'd be looking at the front range, Denver. Okay. No, that's helpful. And you know, as you know, I'm in another city, I'm in Boston, and I think what we have going on here is very similar. And I always struggle with, and, and people in general struggle with, okay, do we really think prices are going down? Or, um, you know, there's multiple things going on, as you just as you just addressed. So, but I think what we, Charles, like you said to me, what do you think this chart would look like for Boston? And I think it'll look pretty similar as well as some of your other ones. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing that we have seen, and I guess I like analogies, my best analogy on this is that the last two years, we had interest rates that were really low, two and a half, three percent. I mean, very, very consistently for 18 months, I was seeing clients purchase um, at those rates. And I purchased a home myself in that time frame, and it was at two and a half percent, which is amazing. Um, but we were, because those interest rates were so low, um, people were getting a premium on the sale of their house. So imagine you're at an ice cream shop and you go in and you get a bowl of ice cream and the person that was in front of you in line got all the toppings and that's like that premium of the home uh, sale. So the whipped cream and the chocolate syrup and the cherry on top, they got all of that because you know the interest rates were low, right? Now you're the next person in line, you're selling your house today. Well, all you're gonna get is just that bowl of ice cream, which is pretty good. I like ice cream, but um, now we're selling it more what the homes are worth and people were just selling their homes well above and that icing on the cake or that, you know, all the toppings on the ice cream, that really was due to the interest rates being so low. So while the premium is going to be removed because our interest rates are more closer to the 40 year average, that's where it also might look like home prices are dipping, but it's that premium that has gone away. Hope that makes sense. Yep, that does. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or throw it in the chat. I'm happy to hang on here for a couple more minutes. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So thank you all again for uh, participating and joining. I appreciate uh, your input and questions and um, being here. And again, if I can be of help to you, I'm happy to do so. You can certainly give me a ring. Um, and I worked with plenty of folks that are downsizing and in the same situation. So I'm happy to be a resource for you as well. So I hope you have a great afternoon um, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank Bye. you, Jackie. Thank you. Bye.